All right, uh, Eric was going to preach for us tonight, but he got the second round of vaccine shot, and he's whacked right now, so he was not able to come. And Anthony said, I'm ready to go, let me at it. And I said, well, I don't get to preach very much anymore here, so I, I want it. <laughs> I was gone last week, and then I'll be gone this next week, and uh, so I want it, so I, so I get it. So I trumped Anthony. Amen. All right. So let's take our Bible and go to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25. And it's a great verse. And we'll look at it here in verse 28. And it talks about the individual. And all of you fit that Thing, he, that's the individual, that hath rule, and that has the same, as that's a power to rule. He that hath no rule over his own spirit. So each one has his own spirit, and God wants it to be ruled. Amen? All right. He that hath no rule over his own spirit. So that means he's letting it be unruly. You ever see kids, they say, you say, those kids are unruly. Yeah. It means they don't obey their parents. They walk all over their parents. They're unruly kids. They have no discipline. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down. So if you can imagine in your mind's eye a city broken down and without walls. So what, what broke it down? Some force came in because the walls were down. Remember when Jericho fell? Mm -hmm. And it was a ruined city. Why? Because their enemy came in and knocked it down. You say, well, God knocked it down. Well, he was their enemy. <laughs> All right. Whoever knocked it down was their enemy because they wanted it up. Um, the Bible says here, he that hath no rule over his own spirit uh, is like a city that is broken down. So he's been... Something came in and, and hurt him because he didn't have rule over his own spirit. That, that's what it looks like to me. Uh, uh, it's broken down, a city broken down and without walls. So that city is what you call a vulnerable city. In one place in the Old Testament, they were talking about big cities and little cities. And one time they said, we can take that one. It don't even have any walls. Yeah, so a city without walls is vulnerable, unprotected. Barriers. I remember Brother Gilbert had a great saying that I still use today, and he was talking about children, talking about raising teenagers, and uh, he said, if you want thoroughbreds, you got to put up fences. Think about that one for a while. You don't want any old nag coming in there. You want a thoroughbred? You better put up some fences. Amen? Uh, otherwise, you're going to get a bunch of nags. You're going to get some sloppy old horses that can't run faster than a good foot racer. All right, so the verse says here, it talks about controlling your spirit. Uh, sometimes something happens and you're instantly angry. I mean, you just, they say, fly off the handle. Uh, that's impulsive. That's no control. You let your feelings and your emotions take you away, and you didn't, you didn't even think about it. If you, had you thought about it, you might not have even done it at all. Or if you thought about it, you might have even been madder. I've, I've seen my anger even grow after I think about it. But the control still needs to be there. Amen. All right, let's pray, and then we'll look at controlling our spirit. Now, Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity that we can come together today. And thank you, Lord, that you tell us that we have a spirit. You tell us each one of us has our own spirit, and that each one of us has the ability to control it. And you want us to be that way. We're your children. You know that the devil gets in a lot of times, and we make a mess of things sometimes because of this. And I pray, God, we'd be acute to it. Uh, learn about it, know about it, and pay attention to it, and maybe we can stay out of more trouble, and maybe we can please you more by being controlled, and leave our troubles and our hardships and those things we can't control to you who can. And so I pray you bless the lesson now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, uh, <clears throat> the more bricks you put in that wall, uh, the more you're protected. Amen. You could put up a three-layer wall. Well, that good, 
good for seeds blowing in of weeds and keeping the weeds out, three-foot wall. Or you can put a few more weeds, uh, 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 bricks in there and keep the varmints out. Or you can put more bricks in there and keep some animals, horses out. Or you can put some more bricks on there and keep people out. And if you go far enough, you might even keep a car out. You put a lot in there, you might even keep a tank out. <laughs> Amen? And, and so the more bricks you put up, uh, the better your wall is. Uh, so anything that we can get from the Bible to help us control our spirit will be bricks to our wall. Yeah. And so I hope that we'll pay attention carefully and um, uh, controlling your spirit uh, about, about your, your lust. Uh, take your Bible to 1 Timothy in verse chapter 6. 1 Timothy and chapter 6. And it talks about controlling your lust because um, uh, I guess I like to say it this way, impulsive behavior. You see it, you go, man, oh, man, that's got a good price, and you just buy it, and you get it home, and you're going, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> it was a good sale, though, <laughs> and I got it, <laughs> but I already have two of them, you know, so, you know, it was a, it, it just would have thought about it a little bit, contemplated a little bit, and controlled your spirit a little bit. Uh, lust took you away. You lusted after it, and it took you away. Um, uh, the Bible says here, but in verse 6, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, but godliness, that sounds like a Christian, with contentment is great gain. Uh, a Christian that is content is great gain. He's not a guy that lusts very much if he's content. If he's not content, he's going to lust all the time. And you and I both know lust will control you. Lust will, will, will get you in places you shouldn't go. So you can always want a thing or you can need a thing. And uh, if need is driving you, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the Lord will provide all your needs. If you want stuff, that's a lustful issue. And that's where control needs to come into play. There's nothing wrong with wanting things that you don't need. Uh, but if you're lusting after it and you just got to have it and you can't control it, now you're putting your family in debt that they don't need to be in. No reason to buy stuff is frivolously. You don't need to do it. It's a waste. Amen. Uh, benefits by contentment. He talked about great gain. Uh, that's a benefit. Uh, reasoning is, I'm okay. Will I live? Can I live without that? Well, absolutely. I'm sure I could. So why, why reason to buy it? Satisfaction is happiness. Isn't it? If you want something, that means you're not happy. I'm not going to rest until I get it. <laughs> but if you're satisfied, then you're happy. Amen. Pretty th it takes some thought, but if you think about it, it's good stuff. Um, I'm rich. The man who needs nothing is rich. If he doesn't need anything, then he's got all that he wants. My wife said, I gotta, I'm gonna, supposed to go to be with Josh Stevenson tomorrow, and I'll be there a few days. And my wife said, I'm going to go to the store and get some things. Do you need anything at all for our trip? And I thought for a minute. I says, no, I have everything heart could wish. <laughs> and it's true. I do. I, I don't need anything. What a blessing. What a blessing. When I was a young man, it wasn't that way. I had all kinds of stuff I wanted. Very few I needed because mom and dad supplied for me. So uh, need and want are two big different things. Uh, hurtful things uh, can be things that are lusted after. Temptation is a snare. Foolishness is hurtful. And it, uh, uh, it, it challenges your faith and your credit card debts and, and changes a lot of things for the negative. Um, I talked to a man the other day that made a large purchase. And uh, uh, it was Larry. You remember Larry with that Harley? And he went way overboard and spent that money. And it, it really made him sorrowful. And he wanted the motorcycle. And it was a beautiful motorcycle. But after getting it, he was so far in debt, he couldn't keep up with it. Finally, he just, I said, hey, Larry, next time I saw him, I said, what happened to that beautiful bike? He said, I had to let it go. And I says, why? I, said, I, bought, I bit off more than I could chew. I just couldn't do it. 
And I said, oh, man, lust, lust must have got him. <laughs> if he'd have thought it through and been patient or been satisfied with what he already had, it wouldn't have been an issue that made him sorrowful afterwards, but it was. So the first thing about controlling your spirit was think about the times when, when you're tempted to, when, you, when lust comes into view. Always control your spirit when lust comes into view and contemplate. Uh, sometimes it's evil, and that's a lot easier to say no to it when you know it's evil. Sometimes it's not, but it can still get you in trouble. But if you think about it and uh, contemplate it, maybe even pray about it, uh, maybe you could be spared from uh, losing your control over your spirit to buy things. All right, the next one is found in James chapter 3. And as you're turning there, I'll read this one verse to you about what we just talked about, about lust. It says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Man, what a beautifully worded verse. Uh, it, it's in uh, Luke 12, 15, if you want to make a note of it. Luke 12, 15, it says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Yes. Take heed, beware of those strong words. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Amen. That's great, great verse. All right, the next one is found in James 3 and verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to br bridle the whole body. But the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And so this one has to do with controlling your tongue. Now there it says that nobody can do it. But any attempt to do it's got to be good. And if you just let it go any time you feel like letting it go, obviously you'd be in trouble all the time. Uh, so any attempt is going to be a good attempt. And this one's about the tongue. Uh, it has to do with bragging or boasting. When you boast, it's really hard to keep up with the mouth. Because the mouth speaks great, swelling things. But how to perform that, which is good, I find not. That's what Paul said. It's pretty tough to do. And then when I was a young man, that was real common amongst young men. Young men tend to be, what's the word, competitive. We tend to be real competitive. And it doesn't take much to get another brother, to challenge another brother to try you on whatever issue you're talking about. And uh, a lot of times, oh, yeah, I'm good at that. I can, I can do that. You know, you'd brag and talk about how good you are. And somebody would oh, yeah, let's see. Oops. <laughs> now i got to perform. And uh, it's real hard to do. And then that makes you look like a fool, doesn't it? Because you, you extended yourself. Uh, so controlling your tongue, it has to do with lying. There's a spirit in lying. Uh, and there's a spirit in truth. It takes control to tell the truth. And sometimes um, making a thing better than it really is is also a lie because a lie has to do with deception. And if you say, I caught a fish that big when it was really that big, you told the truth, you caught a fish. You didn't lie. But you made it bigger than it was, which deceived the person, and that, it is a lie. Now, I know that's no big deal, but I'm just kind of give a, trying to give an illustration as to controlling your mouth because your spirit is the thing that comes out of your mouth. Um, and, uh, and the Bible says in James that uh, controlling the mouth is a difficult thing. Uh, in the home, it's a difficult thing. Husband and wife sometimes get in a little tug of war with their mouth. And sometimes, and it's, I'm going to say it just because I know she hates it. No other reason. And that's just plain meanness. Uh, what, if, what if you thought for two minutes, what if you thought for two minutes that, you know, you're, you're, you're going at it with your wife or you're going at it with your husband verbally, and, uh, and you say to yourself, the devil's in this room. Because he is. He is in the room. And he does want to destroy your marriage. And he does want you to hate each other. And he does want you to get divorced. He does want you to hit her. I mean, all that stuff. Amen. All that's, all that's there. You say, oh, you laugh. 
But it's there because look at all the people that do it. Yeah. It's a common thing. It's a common thing. Uh, uh, so uh, if you can control your spirit, uh, a lot of times I'll, we'll get in a little tussle or something, and I'll think to myself, devil's here. Sometimes I'll even tell her, you know, you know, we're doing this, and the devil's trying to get us to hate each other. We need to think. We need to stop, be quiet for a little minute, think about it for a minute. And it always comes out better every time. Why? Because you controlled your spirit, and he that controls his spirit is like a city that's not broken down, and the walls are not down. If you can control your spirit, things are the way they're supposed to be. And you weren't vulnerable to the attacks of Satan, and it, it, you didn't ruin everything. How many times have you woke up the next morning and got to thinking about the day before and think to yourself, I wish I hadn't said that. And most of the time when you think about what you said, had you given it a couple of minutes to think about it, you wouldn't have said it. Because the next day you realized it was wrong. What if you'd have taken some time that day, you'd have figured out it was wrong too. And you could have spared yourself all the trouble. Um, so so um, think about your mouth. Think about bragging, lying, arguing, um, Anything, anything that has to do with the mouth that Satan can use. Amen. And, uh, and then control it. Amen. Control it. Uh, take your Bible and go to James 3. Familiar verse for you, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. I've seen that. I've seen fire before. A world of iniquity. Oh, I've seen worlds before. A whole world full of iniquity. Wow. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That's, that tongue's a pretty powerful tongue, a pretty powerful member, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you ever watch the news media work a crowd? Man, they can work a crowd. They can get a perfectly innocent guy, you know, in court and go to prison just over spreading news about the guy. I'm thinking of, I won't even say what I'm thinking of because it would be controversial. Um, but one of the best things you can do as a Christian uh, uh, is possess a tongue that has control. And uh, that would be a real helpful thing to you. Uh, notice what it says here in verse uh, 5. Uh, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And boy, you just think about that, you know. You look at this big forest fire and it's taken miles and miles of forest. You go, wow, look at the destruction. And the guy's standing there with a spent match. Started with this. One little touch. Way it goes, and that's boy, that's that's how the tongue can do. Uh, talk about gossip, you know. Talk about backbiting, uh, saying hurtful things, and boy, once it gets out, you can't take it back. It's it's like shooting a bullet, man. It's out, and it's gonna go do some damage, and uh, you gotta be careful. All right, the next one is found in Hebrews chapter ten. So we looked at um, controlling your lust because that's a spiritual thing and controlling your tongue and words and things that it, it has the power to do. All right, this one is found in Hebrews 10 and verse 36. You have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. All right, so it talks about patience, and it talks about having uh, or doing the will of God and and having patience to wait for the reward. I had a lady come to me yesterday. Was it yesterday? What was yesterday? Uh, I was coming in from Arizona on what day? Month, Tuesday. So Tuesday, she came to me. She said um, she, was, she was a pastor's wife, and she was talking about some of the things that are going on in church, and it really bothered her. And she said, these people are doing this, and this woman said this and that. And she was going on and on. And she says, that is so hurtful, and I'm so mad at that woman. And I, and I thought, well, I understand, your, I understand your anger. And she says, you know, she said this. Anthony was there. She said this. 
How many times do you put your heart out there and let people stomp on it? And I says, well, you got to put your heart out there because they don't know. They're just brand new Christians. They don't know. And you're going to try to help them. You want them to learn to be good Christian. And you want to give them advice. And you want to tell them how this thing works and how good it can be and how nice it is. So you put your heart out trying to help. And sometimes they don't take it. Sometimes they'll turn and rend you. Sometimes they'll turn and they'll stomp on your heart. And that's what this woman did to her. And she says, and I said, Sister, I, I told her what Sam Gibb told me. You just have to, the next lady that comes along to in the church, a brand new one, and wants help, you have to put your heart back out there. And if she, she may stomp on it, she may not. But if she does, it's going to wound you. And then you just take that heart back, and then the next lady that comes in, you just keep putting it out there, and you just keep getting stomped on. And she says, why would I do that? And I said, because when you get to glory, if you, if you weren't treated well, God's going to make it up to you. And that's why. And then I pulled her aside, and you weren't there for this, but I pulled her aside, and I said, gave her the verse about Jesus and how the Bible says how Jesus suffered in the flesh and that how he was uh, wounded above all other men. And it said, therefore, because he was treated unfairly, because he didn't get what he deserved, therefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name because he suffered more than all other men. So now his name is above all other men. Not only is his name above all other men, but God is going to reward him in eternity above all other men. So he will have the preeminence in all things. Why? Because he wasn't treated well. So I told her that. And I said, sister, that's what keeps me going. It's because I know that, and I get treated well. But if I'm never not treated well, if somebody ever does me bad, it doesn't make me not want to come back to church. It doesn't make me want to quit pastoring because I know that's for God. It's not for me anyway. It's for him. Not only that, but if anybody treats me unfairly, that's up to him to say whether it's, whether it's unfair or not. And if he deems it's unfair, he's going to bless me for staying in it in spite of that. And that ought to keep you going too. That will keep you going. When people do that, you, you just suck it up, as they say. Amen? And then realize and know that God will make it up to you someday. And you're going to suffer but for a moment, but you'll glory in eternity. Amen. So the price doesn't even compare. Uh, what's that one verse that talks about that? About it doesn't even compare. The things that happen here don't even compare to the thing. Come on, brother, give it to me. It's a great verse. And, and I, it's talking about... Uh, the things of this are for a light of affliction, but the one coming is far greater or something like that. Great verse. We'll wait just a minute for that. See if you can find it. Well, that's a good one. That's a, that's a sister verse to the one I'm thinking of. But if you suffer for well-doing, uh, happy are you, I think it says. For God is able to reward you or something. I can't remember how it goes now. All right. Uh, you still looking or did you exhaust your efforts? All right, give me that one, Brother Charlie. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's the one I was looking for. All right, what you got, Abe, in 12, and 12 to 14? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. There you go. Amen. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. 
Amen. So never, never let that be a reason for you to say, ah, that's it for me. I, I ain't dealing with that person no more. I ain't going to church no more. I, you know, I'm not going to go door knocking anymore. They chewed me out. They gave me a run. Never let that be. That, you're cutting yourself short. If you can just weather it and say, well, okay, that's the way it goes. That doesn't change who I am. That doesn't change God's uh, thoughts and love toward me. That doesn't change the purpose of Christ that I have to do in my life. So let's just keep going. But a lot of people let that bother them, and it does bother them. I understand it bothers them, but, man, if you let that make you quit or if you let that ruffle your feathers to the place where you want to retaliate or then make compound the problem, uh, man, it's a big mistake because glory waits if you can just take it. You can just take it patiently. Amen. All right, let's take our Bible and go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. I'll try to move through here a little bit about controlling your spirit. And you could probably think of all kinds of things in your life where it takes control. Uh, patience, being impatient is one thing. I can remember uh, when I was a little boy, and my dad said, I want you to learn how to clean out the ashes in the fireplace. And he said, that's going to be one of your chores. From now on, you're going to have to clean out. When, the, when, the, when the, that gets full, I want you to go out and clean it. And I said, would I always say, well, I don't know how to do that. You know, go, I know, but let me show you. So he takes me out in the backyard, and he takes the little door off the back of the fireplace, you know, and he says, inside there is just full of ashes from all the fires we burn. Because in the house, there was a little hole in the bottom of the furnace, uh, the fireplace, and we would scoop all the ashes, and it fell down the hole. So in the bottom was a big pile of ashes. And after a while, it gets full. So he says, here's what you do. And he had a little shovel, and he had a little bucket, you know, and here's, you go that and do that. And I remember, he said, okay, you try it. And I can remember getting frustrated, and I couldn't get it, and I got mad. And, rah, 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 you know. He says, he says, son, take it easy. <laughs> the, the ashes ain't going anywhere. Just take your time. If, if you can't get it, think about how you can get it. Make it work. All right, so I'm trying again, and pretty soon I got frustrated again, and rah, rah, uh, you know, he, he, he looks at me and says, put the shovel down for a minute. Put the shovel down. He says, you know, I perceive you're a very impatient young man. That's exactly what he said. And he says, if you don't get control over it, it's going to cause you trouble all your life. And, of course, then I found out what he was talking about as the years unfolded. And to this day, uh, I, I tend to be more impatient than the average person. But I'm glad I got saved because I would have had no restraints on myself at all had I not. But now that I know the Bible, I know the value of it. So I, ha I, have, a, I, have, I have some help. Uh, Karen, you, you're amen because you, you're like me. We, we, when the sun comes up, well, you know, we're like a horse at the gate. Open it, hurry, somebody pull that latch. <laughs> and Abe's the opposite of me. He's just real patient. And when we do a job together, yeah, Pablo's that, and we do a job together or we play a game or something together, you know, sometimes I'll make a mess and he goes, man. And he's even nicknamed me Ampy. Is that what you call Ampy? You're just too, too impatient. Huh? Hasty. Huh? Hasty. hasty, yeah, hasty. So controlling those things. Um, and uh, and it, it's a blessing to be able to just take your time and be patient. But, boy, if you're wired otherwise, you're going to need a lot of, a lot more restraint than the average person. All right, Hebrews 10 and verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you may receive, uh, you might receive the promise. Um, let's go to James 1, 4. And I like that one in Hebrews, because if you're patient and you know that the day's coming when God's going to make it right, he's going to make it right. And I'll just have to wait until he comes and not worry about it until he comes. All right, James 1 and verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye have, an, uh, uh, it says, uh, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And when it says patience have her perfect work, her work is letting things mature to their full maturity. That's her perfect work. Because the thing has got its best value and best strength when it's fully mature. Amen? Amen? You don't want to put a child in there to box a full, a grown, a grown man. 
you let him grow, let him get fully developed to where he can stay in there with the guy, he has a much better chance. You just have to wait. Uh, I remember being in high school, and on the, in the 11th grade, a lot of my friends were quitting prematurely. They wanted to just go. They, wanted to, they already had a little job. They worked on the summer. Now school's starting again. They didn't want to go in the senior year. They were already making a little bit of a paycheck. Their boss was already saying, hey, come on, I'll hire you full time. They wanted to go, and some of them did. And they quit school, and they went ahead and got the job. And, boy, that happened to me. I was working at Federal Fire Hose, and I was inspecting fire hose and putting stencils on fire hoses and coiling fire hoses up for apartment buildings and all that stuff. And I went to my dad, and I said, I think I'm going to quit. He says, quit what? I said, quit school. He goes, no, you're not quitting school. I said, yeah, Dad, I'm, I've got this job. They're going to give me full time. I can make the money. I'm going to school to learn how to work. I know how to work. I'm doing it. I'm getting the paycheck. I don't need the school no more. I know how to read. And he goes, that's debatable. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Uh, but he said, no, no, you need, to, you need to complete your schooling. And I said, why? I know, I know math. I know reading. I know some history. He says, I know, but school goes for 12 years, and I want you to graduate. They want you to complete your schooling. And I said, no, I'm going to quit. And he goes, no, you're not going to quit. You're going to get your diploma. You're going to complete your schooling. And I did. But only because he made me. Only because he made me. And I'm glad he did. Because when I went my next job, they said, uh, on the application, they said, do you have a diploma from school? And I found out later, if you don't have it, you don't get the job. And I went, ooh, I'm glad I listened. To well, I didn't listen. I didn't want to do it. But I'm glad my dad made me do it. <laughs> So let patience have her perfect work. That means uh, let it mature. Let it come to full, full maturity. In James 1, 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And boy, does it ever. The trying of your faith. A trial is to put you through a test to see whether you perform the way you're supposed to. And boy, when you get put through those tests, it takes patience. And if you're successful through that test, you, you end up with patience. Is that the way it's worded? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, yeah, worketh patience. Yeah. And um, I got a little illustration here. I'll just read it. I don't remember what I put down here. It says here, I knew a man who was, a grocery, who, who was at the grocery store and got out to the car and overlooked an item. He thought, oh, I could have had this free, but then he would be a thief. So he went back and paid for it. One day God will take care of all his needs forever. Uh, so the idea was uh, it was a trial of his faith. And he purchased a bunch of items, got to the car and realized they didn't charge him for something. And he goes, oh, I got it free. I got this free. Woohoo, a freebie. And then he thought, well, I'm a Christian. I, if I take this as stealing, I don't want to be a thief. God doesn't want me to be a thief. Let me take it back and show him that it wasn't, I didn't charge me and charge me. That, that's a trial of your faith, isn't it? It's a trial of your faith. You know you believe, not good to be a thief, but now you're on that end of being one. <laughs> Amen. So you, you do the right thing and it has to do with being patient. All right, take your Bible and go to Romans 5. And we'll look at verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work with patience. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. All right, uh, there's a good one in Galatians 15, or no, I'm sorry, Romans 15. And verse 4. So Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written afore time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so it's great to read your Bible. It gives you hope. And it, it gives, you, gives you patience. Makes you, it makes you patience because you say, well, that's okay. My day's coming. Right? Right? It's okay. It's all right if this is a bummer. My day's coming. One day, it's going to be all okay. And so you just wait it out. 
laid it out. And uh, we were just going through a little town called Hope. Remember that, Anthony? When you go down uh, off of highway, uh, off Freeway 10, you hit 60, and it skiers over toward uh, where we were going to Chino Valley. And there's uh, the first little town is Brenda. The second one is Salome, and the third one is Hope. And when you go through Hope, it's just it's just a quick stop and go. I mean, there isn't. There isn't even a, I think there's a small restaurant. I was going to say there isn't even a restaurant. There's a little small eater there and a little, one gas station, and then you're through hope. And when you go through hope, there's a little sign that says, you are now beyond hope. <laughs> <laughs> I should go get my little sign out and put, you're entering hope. <laughs> put a big Bible there or something. Anyway, all right, uh, so let's move forward here. Um, let's take our Bible and go to Colossians 3. This will be the last thing we want to talk about this this evening the message has to do with controlling your spirit and that has to do with your lust uh, your tongue your impulsiveness your, your patience and those things all right Colossians 3 and verse 14 and above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness uh, this one says and now abideth faith hope charity these three but the greatest of these is charity. And so you're looking at your heart, controlling your heart. And it has to do with, um, uh, if you're charitable, what are you doing? You're helping somebody out, right? You know, I want to be charitable. What are you doing? Well, uh, March of Dimes. I want to be charitable. I'll give to the March of Dimes. Well, what are you doing? Well, you're helping somebody out, right? That's what charitable is. And the reason it's so closely related to love, charity and love are so close together is because if you're going to help somebody out, it has to do with your heart. It has to do with being kindful to someone else, being thoughtful to someone else. So they're very closely related. All right? Uh, so we're looking at your heart right now and controlling your love, controlling your love. And uh, the Bible talks about charity being a, the, the best thing out of faith, hope, and charity. And above, above all the other things are the charity. And so control your heart. Uh, try to be giving the best you can to others. And I think our church is really good on this issue. I don't think I hardly ever have to preach about giving at all. Every time we do anything at all, we need money. Man, the, man, the saints just come out. We come out well. I think we gave Brother Donovan, do you remember Pablo? Yeah, I think it was a little more than that. It was, it, he even wrote me back and said, man, brother, you guys really... Thank you so much for the gracious love offering that you gave me. Uh, and I don't say anything to anybody. I just, you know, you guys just give, always have. Uh, but not only do we, but do we are giving when people come in, and, and I was always taught to take care of the men of God that come our way, and we should. And I'm glad we do that. I'm glad you do that. Uh, but not only that, but I think our church is pretty good when it comes to caring for others, too. I think you guys go out of your out of your way. We helped uh, Ty. Now, she, she lost her... Uh, she didn't lose it, but they told her that she could she could only stay here in San Pedro for a little while. Her time came up. They had to move her toward L.A., I think you were telling me. She's more toward L.A. So she told her, I'm not going to be able to make the distance today, uh, but we'll try to work something out. She loves the church and wants to come back, uh, but we're going to have to work something out. But I've already had a couple guys say, hey, just let me know. Give me the green light. I'll go get her. I don't care. And so that's cool, man. Our, our people are, are giving and thoughtful, and it's just like that. Uh, there might be a little stingy heart in here somewhere. I don't know. I don't want to lock on too many. But I, I'm, I think our, I, I love my church along this line. I think we have a very gracious church, very giving church, very thoughtful church. The only thing we're a little bit lacking on is when visitors come in, it would be good if before you left, you just go say hi. Just, I mean, a five-second, hey, good to have you, man. What was your name? Sally. Oh, I'm Stephen Sally. Good to meet you. Glad you made it to church. Hope to see you next time and leave, you know. But just that little, one little contact means a world of difference. I've had a couple people in the past say, you know, came in, nobody even said a word to me. Said, really? I'm surprised. She said, yeah, well, nobody said a word. In fact, I well, kind of thought, man, maybe this ain't my church. But God moved in and did some other things, and it worked out. But, but we're a little lacking there. And I know it's not because you're not, uh, you, you, it's not that you don't like visitors. You just don't think about it. You know, service is over. It's time to adjourn. We say the prayer. You're thinking about lunch or something, and you just go. You don't think, oh, let me stop and go see that visitor real quick. But that's why I'm saying it. I think it would be good if you did. 
it'd be real good if a couple people approached people, let them know, hey, we appreciate having you. I'd like you to come back. And, um, and so that's to do with this thing here uh, about controlling your heart. I'll read this verse to you. Uh, it says, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. So that really encouraged him. That really encouraged him to know that Timothy was praying for him, thoughtful about him, and uh, for the same cause. Here's another one. We, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. That was, uh, that was a compliment that Paul paid uh, to uh, Titus in Titus. And the last one tonight, it says here in Ti- uh, 2 Timothy 3.10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. And so Paul had those things. So he's not just telling you to have them. He, he worked at it himself. So charity cannot be a waste. Anytime you use it, it's going to be a benefit to the cause of Christ. And it makes no... Um, uh, I can't even read my own writing, so I won't even try. But charity is a good thing to have. All right, so controlling your spirit tonight. And you come in here. First thing you got to do to control your spirit when you come into church is shift gears. That's the first thing you got to do. I'm not in the world. I'm coming into church. This is a different realm. Amen? I'm out there. Now I'm coming in here. I'm out there, I'm hustle, bustle, trying to get somewhere, no, no, no. Then I come in here, no, 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 no. I'm not hustle and bustle. I'm going to change my mood now. I come in here, oh, now I'm in church now. This is better. These are my friends. Yeah, everything's okay now. It's sketchy out there, but not now. Now it's okay. Then you got to change gears. And then sometimes that takes a few, takes a little bit of work. But usually on the first or second song, you, you, change, you shift. How many of you know how to drive a stick shift? Oh, so you understand shifting gears. Push that clutch in, bang that gear, and let that clutch out, and you go to another speed. <laughs> Amen. So that's the first thing you got to do when you, when you, for your attitude, your uh, spirit. Talking about controlling your spirit. All right, let's all stand tonight.